that's been on my heart, not just the message that we preached the week before last, but just the attitude of believers. I think it's easy to become apathetic, comfortable, passive. We go through the motions. Even church, we can be so distracted that we're not zoning in on why we're here. Why did we come this morning? I've asked our pastoral staff, I've asked everybody involved today, I want today to be different. So for the next 20, 30 minutes, we're going to sing and pray, sing and pray and sing and pray to set our hearts up for the message. You can't pray too much. Actually, we don't pray enough. Our nation is hurting. Our world is hurting. We can get so mad at these decisions that are happening that they pass in New York and we're like all oh, riled up about it. But you, you guys realize that if we're not on our knees, we have no excuse, no, no right to get mad. If we are not doing our jobs and we come in the church so distracted, then God says, it's, you're the hope. If my people will pray, if my people would turn from their wicked ways, if my people would seek the face of God, that's the hope. So let's not complain about what's going wrong. Let's us as a church do what's right. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and pray with me. Pray that God speaks to us. Pray that God is with us. Pray that God is working. Pray that God stirs us. We need revival, an awakening touch of movement of God and it starts like this God we bow our heads Lord we know that we walked in here battling the weather outside getting kids ready Lord maybe even getting into arguments with our spouses or families as we came here today Lord we go through life filled with stress problems work school Lord, health and issues. But Lord, right now, I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to set those things aside. Lord, to, to, to come to you, Lord, empty and broken and seeking and wanting. Lord, for us to open up our eyes to our great need. Lord, to lift up our eyes to our great God. Lord, change is never going to happen unless we seek you. So Lord, right now, help us, Lord, to hear from you in this service. Lord, help us as a church to have a desire for a touch of God, a movement of God. Lord, I know that that only comes, Lord, when we first humble ourselves. Lord, we've got to know that we need it. We've got to know that something's missing. We've got to go after you and ask you. So, Lord, we're doing that with our words right now, through our worship right now. Lord, we need you. Lord, meet with us. Speak to us. Lord, take over this service. And Lord, help us to walk out of here differently than we came in. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's stand together. With full hearts, let's worship our God. God is so good. God.
remain standing and pray with me again? Let's just pray about some things going on in our own lives. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we're going to stop and focus on where we're at with you. We don't want anything to hinder you from working this morning. I know I can get distracted. I got so much on my mind, and it easily replaces the reality of what, what life is truly about. And that's honoring you and pleasing you and serving you. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, if there be any sin in our lives, Lord, that you'll help us through the leading of the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts. I pray, Lord, that each one of us as we stand here will really look deep. As David said, search me, O God. And I want that in my life, God. I want you to search my heart and prick me by the Holy Spirit. Prick my heart. And I pray, God, that you'll reveal to us anything that we need to remove, change, Lord, help us to be serious about this. Help us not to lose track with with just life in general of what you're trying to do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul prayer this morning is for the Lord to draw near to us. I'd like to welcome you to Fellowship Baptist Church this morning and as we continue this morning's service with our emphasis in prayer and we're going to get back to prayer in just a moment, I'd just like to bring your attention to the bulletin and our fine uh, ushers and uh, greeters in the back, if you didn't get one of these, get one. Uh, they've got a little thing in them called a connect card. If it is your first time, if you're new here to fellowship, we'd love to have you fill this connect card out. There's an image on the screen. Uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. We'd love to meet you. We'd love to, to get to know you. But if you also have a prayer request, we also use these cards for that as well. Whatever's on your heart, what's near and dear, what's going on in your life, put it on there. Let us know what we can pray for you about. Uh, at the end of our service, we're going to take up an offering and you can drop that card right in the offering plate and we literally get these and pray over these as a staff weekly, individually, by name. So let us know what we can uh, pray for you about. But for now, let's, let's go to the Lord as we continue in prayer this morning and uh, just ask him to be in our service. Uh, but more specifically in, in this prayer, we're going to ask for God to be with us as moms, as dads, as, and leaders of our homes, leaders in our workplaces, leaders in our church, that he would give us wisdom uh, and let us be who we are to be in him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again for our service this morning. And Father, I, I pray for uh, all of the moms and dads here. Lord, I pray for the grandmas here and the grandpas here. I pray for the uncles and the aunts. Lord, make us into people who glorify you. Lord, I pray that you would grow us spiritually. And as I can speak for a father, Lord, I know there have been many times in my fatherhood already that I have not been the man who you have called me to be. I've not been the dad who you've called me to be. I've not been the husband that you've called me to be. Lord, I pray that you would change that in my heart today. I pray as we hear the word of God preached, as we continue to sing songs to you in worship, that you would convict my heart, melt my heart, mold it to be who you want it to be. Lord, I pray as moms and dads in this room, you would uh, build us up, help us to stand up to be parents that glorify you. Help us to raise our children to glorify you, to fear you, to honor you. But Lord, help us as leaders, as we have leaders in our church here, leaders in our community here, leaders in the workplace, leaders in our home. Lord, we need wisdom from you. Lord, give us boldness again to lead in a way that honors and glorifies you. And Lord, we love you. We give you all the praise, all the glory for all these things we ask. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Stand, let's sing together again.
sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. stir us up often life has a way of distracting you of pulling your sights off of what God has for you putting them on things that really don't matter that much let's pray together Father we just come to you this morning as a church and we want to thank you for what you've done for us how you've died for us how you've given all for us And God, today I pray, and we're asking together that you would revive our hearts. Lord, for those of us that in the past our walk with you was more vibrant and more filled with life and passion, God, I pray you'd renew that passion for the things that matter to you. God, I pray that you would stir us up this morning, that we would come back to your word with a renewed love and care for what you care about. God, I pray it not be something that we have to work up, but that you would work in our hearts today. Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you for our kids. We need you for our neighbors. God, we're asking so personally today that you would speak to our hearts from your word. Teach us exactly what you want us to know. Show us exactly where we need to go. And God, I pray you would revive our church, revive our hearts. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to say thank you, first of all, for week before last, I was blown away with the surprise. I uh, I guess everybody knew but me. Um, about the surprise night that they had planned for my 10-year anniversary as lead pastor. And uh, it, was, it just meant a lot. Just, I, I got a stack of cards. They're by my bed, and I've been pulling them out and just reading through and, and, and letters and notes and things. And it just, I, I just want you guys to know that it means a whole lot to me. I, just, I feel honored to be the pastor here. I love, I love it. I, I just I feel spoiled to have such a great church family, and so it just meant a lot. I just, I, I don't think I could thank each individual person for every card and note, and, and a lot of people gave the, the greater things, probably the greater things probably to this right here, 
all these things that we're doing, just trying to create the tools that we need to reach this generation and go after them, and God's really blessed. So thank you for giving to that as well, and just it just means a lot. And um, you guys pray for uh, us pastors. We're getting ready. Um, we're going to go to a pastor's conference. I do this every year. I, I take our guys, pull us out, bring us somewhere to be charged up and uh, hear preaching and teaching. And uh, so we'll be taking off actually later this afternoon to go to that conference. We'll be gone for the next uh, few days. And so it's an opportunity. You pray for us because, I mean, pastors, there's, there's a lot on our hearts and minds, a lot that we go through. And it's wonderful to get away and sit down and let other people speak into us. And, and just pray that God renews our hearts, that God speaks to us and the fellowship and all the things that we'll receive through this. And uh, tonight we have a missionary, Ron Todd, that will be speaking in the service. So you encourage him. I, I, the, the timing of it was good in the fact that he's here to speak, but bad in the fact that I wasn't able to be here with him. Uh, but I know that you guys will do a great job loving on them tonight and stuff. So we're excited about what God's going to teach us and come back and be able to share that knowledge and, and things that God's done in our hearts with you guys. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. We're going to go to 34 today. And uh, we're talking about back to the book. And you probably haven't got grasped onto what's the book. Why isn't he calling it the Bible? It is the Bible. And the passage that we're reading right now, they found the book. Um, changed them. They, had, they always had the book. We, we've always had the book. It's just a matter of what we do with it. I want, I want to talk about that. I've thought about this. I've always been fascinated with revivals, the Great Awakening, uh, different names throughout history that they've used for the Great Awakening, the Great Revivals that they had. Uh, one of them in particular that a lot of people remember, uh, it's for like history, historical sense of it, it was the 1730s and 40s, the ones that we read about probably the most. Through the 13 colonies and through Britain, uh, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, these men would travel from city to city. They were, they were stirred up. The, the state of society had become so apathetic to the things of God and the, the more freedoms they got, the more apathetic they became. They got distant from God. They got cold. There wasn't anybody seeking after God. It was just a matter of just being complacent. And that's easy. It's, it's a comparison of where we're at today. And, and, and seeing the picture, I think Richard has one of the pictures that this is just kind of an image. They would go to a town and they would set up what they called scaffolding or a platform that was just makeshift stage high enough for people to see them. They oftentimes didn't have ampl amplification or anything like that. And they would just get up there and they would just take the word of God. And they begin to just bring people back to what mattered, back to what they lost, back to what they got away from. And the Bible is it's so powerful in the fact that sometimes, guys, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm thankful for us having screens that everybody can see, and I'm thankful for chairs that we can sit in, I'm thankful for the pulpits that we can use, and the illustrations, the instruments. The power of God does not lie within any of these things. Do we need them? Yes. Are they tools? Yes. Thank God for heat. Thank God for buildings. Thank, thank God for nurseries and check-in systems and all. But I want you to know the power of God does not lie in material things. And sometimes we put our whole church experience into what entertains us or what awakens our senses of, of, oh, I like that, and that was cool, and that video was nice, and, and all these things that are, are tools or add-ons, but they're not the main thing. And these men would stand before them, and they would just preach God's word. One of the famous messages from this era was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. History tells us that he literally took his message, he laid it on the pulpit and he looked down without even looking in the audience and he began to read from top to bottom about the sin of society and how man has drifted from God. And the Bible is so powerful. Not Jonathan Edwards. Not the platform. But the word of God that began to penetrate the hearts and the minds of the people that were there. It wasn't hype. 
It wasn't emotionalism. Just straight up conviction. And the Bible... The history tells us that as they began to hear the words of God in their pew, they began to grip the back of the pew and begin to cry out in different areas for God not to let them go to hell. And an awakening began to happen where people began to turn from the wicked ways and turn back to God. You say, what has happened? I don't see that today. I, I, when I was a kid, I... I and a teenager growing up, I went through different glimpses of, of, of times I've been in services where I can tell you, and I can't even explain it. Don't ask me to put it into words. I can't. Unless you've been there, you can't. Where I've been in services where the preaching happened and before the message was over, people began to come forward and weep. And I, I remember as a kid going up to the altar, and I'd, I'd be able to see the spots. And by altar, I, I literally mean a place to pray. It's not about where you pray, it's who you're praying to, the very fact that you are doing it. In the heart of what you're doing, where you look up and say, God, I need you so bad. Something's missing. And I remember seeing literally where you could see tears, wet marks in the chairs and in the, on the altar and on the carpet. I remember people gathering to pray and going into the service. And they began to sing songs. And as they're singing songs, people began to come to the altar. And by the end of the night, people were saved. And I know this because I was in one of those services that I got saved. You say, what was it like? It was, it was like, and I'm not being charismatic or weird or whatever, but sometimes we downplay the working of the Spirit of God. Do you guys understand that the Word of God is powerful and the Spirit of God moves? It does. It goes out and it hits the hearts of people. We sit there and say, I, I don't know what's wrong with my kids and my husband's so cold to this and my, my wife is apathetic and my, nothing gets through to my kids. Nothing will get through to your kids like the word of God. Nothing will change your husband like the word of God. The priority of the church, the priority of your life, the priority of your family has to be the word of God. There is no substitute we can have a song service. We can watch our videos. We can hear the announcements. We can promote our activities. But nothing replaces the word of God. And a nation or a church that gets far removed from the word of God gets stagnant and dead and cold and apathetic I gave this illustration last week, and I was talking about Adam and Eve, of how they had, the, we talk about the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus, he had God. God spoke to him, don't do this, and this is what I want, walk with me in the garden. And The serpent came up to Eve and said, hey, did God really say? And Satan so there and says, you know what? Maybe there's more to life. Maybe you're missing out on something. You know, have you ever thought that there's something else out there? She turned. There's, there's a danger. When God's people begin to turn their attention, their focus from the word of God to the other things, to the influences of the world, whether it's Satan or society or whatever it is, when we turn from God and we turn to the temptations or the world or sins of the world, bad things happen. The Bible says that she saw that the fruit was good to eat. It changed her perspective. There was the presence of sin that was presented and that presence of sin brought a practice of sin. She took the fruit. And the Bible tells us, it explains that there's a progression of sin. It never just stops. It's never good enough. It will never just end. It never will be. Nothing will ever just end with sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. Death. Sin in your marriage, 
sin in your mind, sin of pornography, sin of bitterness will not stop until it destroys you. Thorns and thistles came as a result of that. The Bible talks about this torment that was there. They were removed from the garden. They were removed from the fellowship that they had in pain and suffering. Uh, great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend you. Do you guys understand that great peace in the world that we live in, and I'm not just saying the world, I'm talking about church and society and families, young people and teenagers and parents, husbands and wives, of our culture, in this room, in this building, in our day and age, are lacking peace. Something's off. I think we're caught in the middle. I'm not saying that we're out in adultery. And we're not in idolatry. And we're out, well, I was going to say killing babies, but our nation's doing that. It's not as bad as Manasseh. Second Chronicles chapter 33. The Bible says, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not eat of the fruit. Today it's different. That thou shalt not was anything that opposed God. It turns our attention over here. Guys, I'm just going to shoot you straight. If, you're, if I offend you this morning, it's not me offending you. It's just truth, okay? It's just truth. Sometimes we squirm because we hear things that go against what we do or what we have in our life, and we get so upset. Do you understand that Satan will mess with your head all day long and say, you don't want to be around that preacher, that church, da, 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 da. He'll do anything he can to pull you from the word. To get you to turn to everything else. See, we, I, I'm using the illustration of the apple, but I'll tell you, in Manasseh's day, they were false gods. They would build these idols up, and they were an abominations. You know what an abomination is? It's something that morally goes against God. Something that turns our head against God. I begin to think about what our culture is. In our culture, the Bible says clearly that thou shalt not... Commit adultery. It's, it's actually one of the Ten Commandments that he, that he gave us, that He put into our lives for our protection. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus was teaching. He was talking to the people and He began to get on this issue. And in Matthew 5 28, He took it to the next level and He said, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He was saying this, he said, I, I, I'll tell you what, I've got a plan for your life and I've got a plan for men and I've got a plan for purity and I've got a plan for teenagers. And he said, I'm, I'm going to explain to you this, when you turn and you look upon a woman to lust after her in your heart, you have committed adultery. You realize that the world the very thing that I'm talking about, they view as entertainment. You guys realize that in the culture that we live in, adultery and looking at a woman is what they put in magazines and on TV and movies. And our society is saturated with this. Psalms 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the works of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Years ago, we, we, we lived in a, a society that people would have to seek out to look at things that were wrong. Pornographic materials. It's never been more convenient in all of our lives. Today, there was proven men ministries that conducted a search by the Barna Research Group and statistics for young Christian men that said 77% of them look at pornography at least monthly. 36% of them view pornography on a daily basis. 32% of them admitting to being addicted to pornography. 
We have this society, and I've heard this myself. You guys have heard this. Well, Tony, you're just not going to get away from it. That's just the world that we live in. It is the world that we live in. I'm not going to deny that. But the law or the way that I am to live is not according to the world, but according to God. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You understand that the very principle that God was given us when it came to this, that we have turned and said, this is just the way that it is. And Satan is so subtle. Because I, I, don't, I don't care saying these things. It doesn't bother me in a bit because I see the results of it. It disgusted me when I saw that, I don't have a picture of this or whatever, there, there was a movie, a superhero movie called Deadpool. It came out with Deadpool Part 2. Deadpool Part 2, one of their advertisements was a reenactment of Jesus coming back through the clouds and he's like this with all the characters in, his, in the white room and, and you, you can look it up. It's, it's an actual advertisement. 97 F-bombs that they drop in there. GD throughout the whole thing and nudity. He had Christians will say, well, it's just entertainment. It's just funny. Let me explain. It's just sin. Amen. It's sin. But in our culture, we've been so sucked into it. When God says, don't look at another man's wife naked. Don't lust upon her. Do not take God's name in vain. All the things that God has said, and we turn around in our culture, the same, we look at it Manasseh's day and say, well, they, they were crazy. They were worshiping false gods. God said, I said, thou shalt not to these things as well. We just justify them. It's a popular TV, well, HBO show called Game of Thrones, and they've gone on for like eight seasons or something crazy like that. And I read an article that was published warning Christians, and they said that they bragged on the fact that there's so many sex scenes in it that they actually had to hire porn stars to do the sex scenes. And they said one of our objectives is one day to put a hurting on the porn industry because people are getting so much of the porn just from watching Game of Thrones. Yet we have Christians we walk through the doors of churches and sit there and say, how great is our God and how great thou art. And we worship you, God. And we wonder why there's anxiety. We wonder why there's stress. Let, let me explain it. The Bible says that no man can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and hate the other the, the Bible says Elijah was standing before them and he said, how long will you halt between two opinions? Either you will serve the gods of Baal or you will turn to God, but no man can do both. The Bible explains to us that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Do you understand? You cannot put in our life an idol of worship or attention of pornography or lust or like just put whatever it is it's, it's bitterness and you're walking around oh you're bitter and mad and angry and you're mad at this and you're mad at that and you walk in church mad and you walk out of church mad and you've got those people that you're mad at and you're mad at them and mad at, that's bitterness God said may it be removed from you because I died to set you free from that Lust, anger, greed. I'm not just highlighting one sin, although I think these, some of these sins are like coming over our nation as a wave. And then we wonder. There's no revival. Because we're here. I, I, I come to church and I hear it. And I want to worship God and I come on Monday night. I'm watching my show and it goes against God and it does things that are wrong. And I know that. And we're, we sit there and we're, we're, we're bobbing back and forth. A double-minded man is unstable. Emotionally unstable. Stressed out. No peace because great peace have they that love thy law. If this is peace, what is this? Guys, let me, let me let you in on a little secret. You say, well, I'll tell you what, my home life isn't right. That's why I watch this stuff. All this stuff. You get your life lined up with this, and I promise you, your marriage will line up too. You want to find a wife that falls in love with you? You fall in love with the word of God and watch your actions and attitudes line up with God and see what happens. 
The Bible warns us about the sin in our society and the sin in our life. The Bible says that sin is pleasurable for a season. It's, it's not that there's not the thrill or the fun or whatever. But I tell you, it, it corrupts the minds of men to the point where they go to their wives and there's no satisfaction. They don't level up. They don't add up because they've been perverted. That's what the word perverted means. It means to twist. We have a twisted perspective of sex, a twisted perspective of our spouses, a twisted perspective of life. And we're miserable. Not even to mention... I haven't even got on the whole fact that we're not experiencing revival and people being saved and, and, and the word of God working because God steps forward. The spirit of God opens the door to the back door of churches and looks inside and says, there's so much dirty minds and filth. You cannot drag it into your mind on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Monday and fill our minds full of the garbage of the stuff of this world and expect revival in our homes on Monday. The Bible says very clearly, you be holy for I am holy. Have we lost sight of that? I mean, holy means to remove sin, to not have sin. I'm not saying that we're ever going to accomplish sinless perfection. If a man, as long as you're in the flesh, you're going to war with the flesh. There's a big difference, guys. There's a big difference between being tempted and just giving in. There's a big difference between flipping through and being tempted and then, or, or the, the, the opposite of sitting there and watching the show and letting it go into your mind. It's wrong. We could do a huge favor to our lives and our families if we would stop asking God for revival. And we started asking God for forgiveness. Because revival comes to those that are purified and cleaned and emptied out and ready, God cannot fill dirty vessels. God cannot fill dirty minds. God cannot revive that which is living in sin and loving it. I know I've taken a long time with this, but I just it's, it's so heavy on my mind. I want you to see something. The Bible says in Isaiah 5.20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. You sit there and say, well, that was a great movie. God says, whoa. Whoa. Warning to those that could sit there and say that was good when God said it's bad. Whoa. Do we not hear the warning as Christians and fathers and leaders? Do we not hear the warning of God when God says, and we pass down the generation to generation? So there was Manasseh, 2 Chronicles chapter 33. He built up the groves, he built them up. The Bible says that he even drug the, he drug the altars into the house of God. Set it up there and he worshipped the false gods. It wasn't, wasn't the apple, it was the false gods, but it was, it was this equivalent of the apple. It was the equivalent of pornography, it was the equivalent. It was things that were abomination that went against God. Manasseh went so far that he actually took the very places, if you would, at the Old Testament churches. And he drug that sin smack into the middle of it. The same way that we do when we watch sin or have sin and we drag it into our hearts and our minds. It's the same thing. They were sacrificing their kids to the gods. They were worshiping false gods because they allowed the world. They didn't just jump up there and say, hey... Throw away everything you believe and go over there. No, it's a slow fade. It, it starts with the turn and the direction and the change of the mind. That's why the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Manasseh has a son called Ammon. Ammon was 22 years old at the end of 2 Chronicles 33 when he began to reign. He only lasted two years. The Bible says that he was more wicked than his father. How wicked would you have to be when the wicked people thought you were so wicked that they knew that the only chance of hope for them was to kill the king? So the servants rose up and they killed that king. But before that, he had a son named Josiah. In 2 Chronicles chapter 
34, and Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem one in 30 years, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of his father and declined neither to the right nor to the left. Verse 3, for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after God of David his father. See, for so long they were caught in the middle. Oh, we worship the father or the God of David, and yet they were worshiping God or claiming God or having the temples or their godly heritage on one minute, and yet they were worshiping the idols on the next. Josiah, being sick and tired of it, eight years old, when he began to seek after God, something in his heart and mind told him that it does not have to be this way. Can I tell every person here, it does not have to be this way. The first thing that he began to do, the Bible tells us that Josiah began to seek after God. So simple. I mean, I, I, I tried to complicate this. I try to figure out what, what does that mean and what does it mean to seek after God? The, the, the Bible literally means when it comes to the word seek, it means to pursue, to ask, to want. It's for us in our lives to simply say that, hey, listen, all the sin and the things that I'm doing, the entertainment and not having joy in my marriage and not being able to lead my family and not having revival in my heart, not seeing people saved, not seeing altars filled, not seeing lives transformed, not seeing all these things. And Josiah says, wait a minute. Does it have to be this way? Do you remember your David, your grandfather? Remember the story about how God brought down a giant with just a stone? Just a stone? This is God. The Bible says that Josiah began to seek after the, the God of David. Tell me more. Tell me more. What do you mean? Jonathan Edwards preached a message and people cried out for revival. Tell me more. What do you mean that God can work in such a way to save my wayward husband or my kids that are doing wrong? What do you mean? Tell me more. God was working. And Josiah began to have something come over him that wasn't normal, that wasn't there before. He said, tell me more. The Bible says that he began to seek after God. The, the, the very word means to ask, to pursue, to want, to desire. It doesn't mean that we have all the answers. But it means just like Eve, when she saw that the food was good, we sit there and say, I'm sick of the food. I'm sick of the trash. I'm sick of the dead. I'm sick, I'm sick of the apathy. I'm tired of it. What would happen if Fellowship Baptist Church and the members of Fellowship Baptist Church just began to go, I, I want more. Satan, you are a liar. That doesn't satisfy. It's not filling. It's not good. I want more. And how we got it, this change of being caught in the middle was to turn around and begin to say, God, what do you want? Jesus was teaching the disciples, and he said, ask, listen this, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find Knock, and it shall be open to you. You know why a lot of times in society, in our life, in Christian culture today, we sit there and say, that sounds good, but it doesn't work. Let me explain to you why. When our lives are lined up with this, and we're saying, God, I need a job. God says, get your heart right. God, I need this. I'm knocking. God says, you're knocking in the wrong places. When our lives align with the word of God and you ask God to fix your marriage or your life or your kids or whatever, things change because here's where the power lands. And a lot of times we're just going through the motions of things. And Man Manasseh didn't do it. Amen didn't do it. Just side began in his heart to ask the question, what does God say? Ask the question this week. Ask the question today. Ask the question an invitation today. 
What does God say? Because a lot of times in our sin, everybody else is doing it. It's no big deal. And you're old-fashioned. And that, that doesn't make sense. And that's just the way I was brought up. And that's that pastor that says that. And da, 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 da. It's, it's all rules. He said, she said. But man, things change when you turn your head and say, God, what do you, what do you want? Lord, is this, is this right? Because society says that I can live with my boyfriend and have premarital sex and I, I, I'm okay because that's just how society says. But you said that marriage is honorable and all. Is this wrong? God, what does it say about getting things right? Because I have bitterness against somebody for a long time and I have anger and I can't even worship in church without being upset or it coming to my mind. And What should I do with it? He began to seek after God. God made us a promise. He said in Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah was the prophet that was preaching during the time of 2 Chronicles and Kings and those passages. The prophet was saying, then shall you call upon me, you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. He said, ye shall seek me and find me, then ye shall search me with all your heart. Did you notice the promise of what God says? You will seek me. And you know what God said? You will find me. And a lot of times where we say those types of things, it's ambiguous. It's just like, what does that mean? Where is it going with that? Let me explain to you, church, what you'll find. Because Jesus is peace. You'll find peace that you could not find in anything of the trash of this world. You're trying to be satisfied with the junk and the movies and the show and the entertainment. You'll find satisfaction because God is the one that satisfies us. You will find the peace that passes all understanding. You will find the joy that you can't find in there. You might find it temporarily in the world, but you'll find it permanently in God. You do know that there's a difference between joy and happiness. I get excited when my team wins a football game, but joy is something in my heart that I know that never leaves because God is constant. In this world that is missing something is because they're not seeking God and they'll never find it. We can preach to the world all day long about how they're looking in the wrong places. Are we looking in the wrong places? I'm going to wrap it up with the rest of that verse in 2 Chronicles. The Bible says that Josiah began to seek after the God of his father. In the 12th year, he began to listen to this. You know what happens? Watch what happens. You talk about change. How do you get out of the middle? This is what happens. In the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten image. Happiness comes when you seek after God or change happens when you seek after God. Change happens when you purge your life. The word purge means to be pure, to make oneself clean. You see, the closer you get to God, you don't have to be told what needs to go. You don't have to be told. God begins to work in your life and you realize what needs to change. Look at those next verses. This is what happens in Chronicles as he begins to seek after God, after he begins to do this. And he realizes, he goes in there and he finds the pornography. He finds the bitterness. He finds the anger. He finds all the things that God said should not be there, the things that we call entertainment, things like that. And you say, no, he found the groves. It's just different in our society. And they break him down. The altars of Balaam in his presence and in the images that were in the high above them, and he cut them down in the groves and the carved images, the molted images, and he breaks them into pieces. You know why? It's not that I just want it out. I want it. I want it dead. I was telling the teenagers, you know what Goliath... What happened to Goliath after David knocked him down? He cut off his head. Those giants in our life of lust and greed and everything else will creep back into our lives. You knock them down and you get them out. And he strode it upon the graves of them and sacrificed unto them. He was sick of it. When he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder, he cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel and he returned to Jerusalem. You guys want to see revival happen in our nation? That's when we get a hold and we seek after God and we begin to want God in our lives and we turn over here and say, you know what, there's some things in my life that has to go. Purge literally means to clean. 
You guys understand that there's some things in our life that God says does not line up, and God says it's time to get them out. I'm talking about revival. I'm talking about a change. I'm talking about overcoming the problems in our life and the anxiety and the stress and the depression and all these things that come. And I'm not saying that, that, that these things aren't real and they just go away. I'm saying that the, it begins with our hearts being right with God that we clean house. How in the world is God going to work in our lives when we're building up altars of sin in our lives and we're allowing them to reign there? How mad do you have to be like Josiah to walk in there and say, you know what? Get out. Knocked him over. Stomping in the pieces. It's ruined us. I don't have a dad today. I don't have a grandfather today. Because Josiah was saying because that sin ruined them. When you see what it does to our society. And guys, it's an awful thing that our nation is now okay with killing babies. Nine months in the womb and be able to kill a baby. That's disgusting. Can I let you in on a little secret? They're not as bad off as we are. Because we know the truth. They're in darkness. They're in darkness. I'm not justifying it. But how dare we sit there and say, well, because they had sex and they, they didn't want that baby. They killed the baby and they feel like they have the right. We're over here looking at another man's wife naked and we're lusting after her and that's okay. I'm having sex with my boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever and that's okay. I shack up with somebody and they're not even my wife, but I'm sleeping with them and that's okay and all this stuff goes against God, but we're going to sit there and pitch a fit with what they're doing. It's a progression of sin. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will mess up your family and mess up your life. I have something going on in my heart that I want to see God work. I want to see a change. I don't want to hype. I don't want a banner. I don't, I don't want, I, I, don't, I want to just a touch of God. I, I want God to speak to my kids in a way that it's not me. I want God to work in services where I could walk out of there and say, today we met with God and God met with us. I, I want to see God use Fellowship Baptist Church to stir up our city. He said, it's not the great awakening. It can be in us. It started with just one or two. It can start with us. The word that comes to mind is repent. It's the change direction. And seek after God. And as you get closer to God, He begins to say, Get this out, change this. We begin to purge our lives and allow God to come in. Every head bowed and every eye closed right now. It starts with us seeking God. I think we're so distracted. When's the last time that you just prayed, God, help me. God, I want you. God, I want more of you. God, I want to change. God, remove the apathy. Lord, I, I, I'm dead. I'm stagnant. Distracted to where we're thinking more about what's going to happen next than we do what God is saying right now. We've come into service irritated, frustrated. We're not even listening to God. I'm not saying that it has to be at the front of this church to get your heart right, but I'll tell you, there's something about God's people moving towards prayer and kneeling down before God and saying, God, do a work in my life. Are we asking? Do we want it? As I tell you, you have not because you ask not. But if you seek, you will find. If you knock, it will be open. If you ask, you will receive. So God, I'm just asking, Lord, for, for conviction to break us, to move us, to change us. Lord, I don't want to stay where we're at anymore. So Lord, turn our direction back to you. 
So, Lord, as we, we sing, as we pray, Lord, break down this sin. Break down the apathy. Change us from the inside out. We pray this in your name. Amen. Will you stand and sing with me? There's something on your heart to pray about. You came here today and you said, I don't even know Jesus. Come talk to one of us. Come talk to me. If you don't have that relationship with God and you have problems in your life, I'm going to tell you, we all have problems in our life. But I can certainly point you to the one that can change your life. We're going to sing. If you want to come pray, come pray. If you want to talk to one of us, come talk to one of us. I've got men that will talk to men and ladies that will talk to the ladies. All I want you to do is to say, Cobb, I want more. I want you. I'm sick of being caught in the middle. As we sing together, you come. My hope is built on nothing less. God work it in your heart. It's been a long time since you felt a nudge of God or a change of God. Are you just floating, existing? Is God pricking your heart to pray? Is God stirring your heart for something? Is God moving you? Hope is built on are going through a storm right now, raise your hand, just admit it. You're in a safe place. It's all right. Nobody's judging. 
Let me tell you something. If you're not, you probably just came out of one. If you haven't, you're probably about to go through one. Because this world is filled with storms. We need God more than we need the air that we breathe. We need God more than the buildings we stand in. We need God more than the programs that we cling to. Please take these principles of God's word and help us to change our world by first changing us. We need church. We need the preaching of the word of God. We need each other. I got surprised this morning to have my sister and my brother-in-law come in, not for good reasons. A lot of you know from the prayers and things that have been going on in Facebook and stuff. Danny lost his mom when they first got married, and Danny and Christine got married and met through our church years ago. And his mom passed away right at that same time, and Danny's sister's 38 years old on the edge of death with cancer right now. It's just, life is hard. It's hard. Don't face it alone. You say, I don't need next Sunday. We all need next Sunday. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday too with Christians. Because church is more than just services and worship. It's people and problems. It's family. I'm glad you're here. Go on a journey with me next Sunday. Because <laughs> Josiah, in his venture, says, go clean up the house of God. They go in to clean up the house of God, and this servant comes out, and he says, we found something. Josiah, we found something. I think it's a book. Josiah says, take the book. Open it up. Read to me. And revival began to come through that nation. Because they got back to the book. Don't miss next Sunday. I want to share with you some powerful principles about the power of God's word that we all have. It's time we find the book and do what it says. Let's pray. Father, Lord, help us to be a people that seek after you with all of our hearts. Because I know, Lord, that we will find you. Pray this in your name. Amen. You can be seated. This time we'll ask the ushers to come ahead. We'll take up our offering. Uh, if you have filled out that Connect card that I spoke about right before the, uh, the message began, uh, if you're a new member here or a, a visitor here today, we'd like you to fill that out to put some of your information on there so we can connect with you and uh, if you uh, maybe something spurred on your mind through uh, Pastor Tony's powerful message there that you want us to pray with you about, jot that down, and I promise you we will pray for you uh, about that this week. Uh, don't forget, we do have ways to give in our church here. We've, if you want to write us a check, if you're a guest, you're by uh, no means obligated to give, but uh, you can get an envelope, drop that in the basket here as these uh, fine ushers pass your row. Uh, you can give online, and you also can give uh, through text now from that number right there on your screen. So many ways to give. Uh, let's at this time go before the Lord and ask him to bless our offering. Your Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for that message. I thank you, thank you, thank you for it, how powerful that was. Lord, I thank you for, for using a man like our Pastor Tony to, uh, to uh, just convict our heart, Lord. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would, uh, as we go through our, our life this week, that uh, you would just help us to strive to be better to be stronger, to be bolder, Lord, to live cleaner lives. Lord, for the offering now, I pray that you'll stretch every dollar that's given, uh, whether it be over the text message through uh, the envelopes that are given today, Lord, or, or online. Lord, I just pray that you would use every cent to further your kingdom, Lord, for your glory. We love you. Thank you for this. Uh, thank you for all the givers here in our church, Lord. We thank you for all the monies given today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, two short announcements as they take up the offering. Uh, the first one is on February 24th at 6 p.m., we are going to be having our business meeting. This is going to be our annual 2019 Fellowship Church business meeting. Again, that will be at 6 p.m. So if, if you are able to come to that, we're going to be discussing all kinds of business as we go into this new year. Again, that will be on February 24th. Uh, and also starting point begins on February 3rd. If you're new to fellowship, you're a new member here, you're a new Christian, uh, sometimes 
parents coming to a new church can be very intimidating, especially uh, I've just kind of went through that. I came from a church that ran about 60 to 80 people, and now I'm at a church that runs about six to 700. So that can be kind of scary, a bunch of new faces and, and new pastors. That's why we have this starting point class. Uh, feel free to register for that. It runs for three weeks. Uh, you'll get to meet pastoral staff. It's, it's a safe place. You can come and ask any questions that you have about our church. Whatever's on your mind, uh, that's what that'll be for. So that'll start again February 3rd. Runs for three weeks. It's at 10 a.m. So it's during our Sunday school hour. You can register at the kiosks outside of the auditorium, or you can register on our website. So go to fbccolumbus.com. You'll click on the events tab once you get there, and you can register uh, right there on the website. We have an exciting day today. Look at him, all donned in his garb. Yeah, so it's so exciting because, come on down here, Izzy. I want everybody to cheer for you real loud. Let's hear for Izzy. All right, if you don't know this little lady here, you're missing out because she is the most exciting little thing we have in Awana Junior Church. She's very faithful to everything. You almost look like you're in a monkey cage. (laughs) Let's go over here. We're going to baptize you. So Izzy gave her life to Christ while at home. She said, I was in my room. And she's, of course, she's been in a Christian home. She's heard the gospel at church and so forth. But it wasn't until she was alone with the Lord, he started convicting her. And it was there in her room she gave her life to Christ. So Izzy, it is my privilege to baptize you now. You ready? On the profession of your faith, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You made me nervous. You were holding your breath before you even went down. Let's get a let's get a picture here. One more big cheer for her, because I have a little a couple of little ladies coming before that. Miss Sanoya, I'm going to have you come. Sanea, if you come down, I told Sanea, I said, I'm really nervous about your name because it's so similar to another name I know. So this is Sanea. And the exciting thing about her testimony, well, when we were talking about it, I said, I wish it was on video so everybody could see because and hear it because there were so many details to it that were just, it just touched me. To know that she was around the gospel and went to church, but it wasn't until about a year ago that you were attending a small church and under the, through the influence of your husband after he got saved, was it your brother-in-law? Yeah. And his testimony and just, just showing her the love of Christ, it just really hit home with her. And it was during that church service that she gave her life to Christ. And then they started attending here. So, but now it's time to show everybody you're not ashamed of Christ. And you're alive in Christ, and she's being baptized and not ashamed to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, you're a little tall, so says, it's been this, everybody's taller than me. So she's going to bend her knees just a little bit. Oh, really? You're mocking me now. All right, I'm embarrassed, and she's still doing it. I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of Christ, raised the walking newness of life. Hey, let's get a picture. Oh, go down a little bit so I look taller. Great. So this is kind of cool. I got Mila. And Mila, while attending uh, Awana, come on, Mila. While attending Awana, when she was seven years old, she gave her life to Jesus Christ. And uh, she remembers the whole experience. Mila, I've known you. We've talked about this. You're 13 now, right? So I've known you since you were three years old. We've been junior church, Awana, all this, and now she's a teenager, getting old. Can't say my hair's going gray, it's just going, all right? Mila, she don't want to put it off any longer, and there's something special about this because her testimony <clears throat> of, uh, of proclaiming Christ through her baptism affected somebody. You're going to be like, who? Well, I'll show you in just a second. So Mila, it is my privilege to baptize you now. And on the profession of your faith, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of Christ. Raised to walk in newness of life. So Mila's telling her testimony to somebody in her family. Dave Stager. How many know Dave? Come on down here, Dave. It's okay. You can respond. All right. I didn't ask you how many of you like Dave Stager. We love you, man. He has served the Lord here for years and years. Grown up in this church. Gave his life to Christ when he was younger. But it just dawned on him through your niece's testimony, I have never followed the Lord in baptism. 
how, how did I miss this? And we talked about it. And you know what? I'm glad it doesn't matter how old you are. Never be ashamed of Jesus Christ. And I know you never have been. But proclaim him. This is an outward testimony of an inward change. So Dave, on the profession of your faith, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bearing the likeness of Christ. Raised to walk in newness of life. Hey, Tony's getting a picture. <laughs> <clears throat> so, oh, come on, Emily. Don't be scared now. I know you're little, but I'm going to help you, okay? Emily's so timid. I want you to give her a big hand, okay? If you're too short, I'll pick you up. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Don't worry. I got you. Here we go. <laughs> you ready? It's like cool. It's like a big bathtub. All right, Emily. Emily gave her life to Christ. She's telling me how... Oh, not yet. You're going to, you'll pass out on me, and then we'll have to drag you out of the water. So Emily gave her life to Christ uh, some, well, I think it was a couple years ago, maybe last year. I can't remember, but it was not too long ago. It was just last year. And uh, she didn't want to put this off. She's been talking to her mom about it. She's sat down with me. And let me tell you this, every one of our children uh, that get baptized, we make sure we go through the discipleship booklet with them, sit down, talk to them about their decision of following Christ and baptism, make sure they understand it, but also check with them about their testimony. We're very sensitive about that. So Emily, it is my privilege to baptize you now in the name, yeah, you can do that. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Christ, boom, woo. Raised to walk in the newness of life. You can open your eyes, look over here, we're gonna get a picture, ready? Yeah. All right. Yeah, you did great. Uh, we both got baptized on that one. Aurora, Aurora is one of our, our Aurora is one of our teenage girls, and I've known Aurora ever since she was riding. She's since you were riding the bus going to junior church. Uh, once in a while, you came to Iwana. <laughs> and so me and her have sat down over and over again talking about. Where God, how God's working in your life. I am so proud of you. I am so proud of this girl because she is not ashamed of Jesus Christ. She's working so hard to follow him. And she said, I don't want to put this off any longer. I want everybody to know uh, I belong to Christ. And it was during Sunday school here at Fellowship Baptist Church that it gave, she gave her life to Jesus Christ years ago. And uh, now it's an open testimony. Your friends, family, and your church family is here, ready to see this happen. So Aurora, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Christ. Woo! <laughs> Raise the walk in newness of life. I love you. Richard, do you trust me? All right. I'm sorry, bro. I love you, man. It's our tech guy up there. We'll get a new mic. Take it out of Chris's pay. Genesis. This is it. You gave your life to Christ and want to follow him in baptism. It was at a VBS or something you were attending with your grandparents, right? And now, you know, you get to tell your church family here, I belong to Jesus Christ and I'm not going to put it off any longer. So I'm going to set this mic over here. Oh, you don't trust me, huh? Genesis, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Christ. Praise the Lord. So, I had the opportunity once in a while to speak in junior church, and this was about four weeks ago. Come on down here, Michaela. It was about four weeks ago, and I was given the gospel, and it was really heavy on my heart. And I saw this little lady sitting there looking up, and you could see God working. And you could see it in her eyes. And when we asked if you wanted to give your life to Christ, she barely raised that hand. And I said, if you mean it, raise that hand high. And she raised it up. And it was there in her seat that she gave her life to Christ. 
so humble and kind. Michaela, it is my privilege now to baptize you as you take your next step of following the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to hand this off. That's a lot of baptisms. A lot of people gave their life to Christ and we're so grateful for it because uh, I love it when people, I'm grateful for when people stand up for Jesus Christ and they're not ashamed. And so, Pastor Chris, here you go. I'm just handing off the mic. I'm gonna run down here. It's a relay race today. I feel like we're on a game show now or something. How exciting that is. Baptisms get me so excited. We had eight of them to see people who have given their life to Christ and are taking those, those next steps unashamedly. Uh, I had the, the privilege of giving my first, performing my first baptism about a month before I came here to fellowship, and there's nothing more exciting than to see God working in a, a young person's life, older person's life. It doesn't matter. God is amazing, and he changes lives radically. And what an outward expression. It's awesome. Uh, a couple more uh, quick things before we get you guys out of here. Uh, we are getting ready to go into a busy time here at Fellowship, and you all know about better than I do. I'm learning all of this, but it's almost Easter, and Easter's going to be here before we know it. And uh, so if you have signed up for the Easter drama, you know today we have the big Easter kickoff meeting. So we have got lunch for you. We want to go ahead and dismiss anybody that's in the cast. You know who you are. If you got an invite to come to the meeting today at this time, go ahead and be dismissed. Uh, we'll be meeting back in the fellowship hall. Go ahead and grab your food, grab your kids, uh, everything else you need to grab, and go ahead and head back there, and we'll get started. That way we can get you guys out of here uh, as quick as possible. Uh, where are we at here? Also, yes, we need your help with a couple things, a couple more things as far as Easter goes. Next Sunday, a week from today, after church, between starting at 1.30 p.m., we hope to get done at about 3.30, we need help bringing up the stage. We're going to be building the next day. But if you, if you are able to come after church next Sunday, help us get the stage up here so that we can start building it on Monday, that'd be great. Which leads me into Monday. That's February 4th. A week from tomorrow, we have an all-day work day starting at 9 a.m. We're going to start building things. We're going to start transforming everything here. So if you have any time at all, even if you can only come out for an hour uh, to help us build this stage up so that we can uh, get a head start on Easter, uh, that would be much appreciated. It was a good day to be in God's house. Amen. Good seeing you guys. Uh, don't forget, we also have Connecting Point. If you want to uh, talk to the pastors, come share what's on your heart. We're going to be meeting right here in the room, right behind the auditorium here, uh, directly after the service. Let's go ahead and pray and thank the Lord for what he's done in our service today, and then you'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you so thankful for what you've done in our service today, Lord. Uh, you have touched my heart in amazing ways from the minute that we opened up singing in worship. Lord, I thank you for the message that you gave Pastor Tony, the challenge that it puts on us as believers. Lord, I just pray again as we go out back into our lives during this week, we go out into the workforce or to the grocery stores or out in public or wherever you have us, Lord, keep this message on our heart. Don't let us leave this message in our pew today. Work on us all week, Lord. Mold us. Make us who we are to be in you. Father, help us to get back to the book. Father, help us to get on our knees, that we could live on our knees, Lord, that it wouldn't just be at church time that we come before you, but, Father, that we speak to you all during the week and that through the reading of your word, we know you intimately. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done here today. Lord, please, please help us to live godly lives outside of here, that we would show the world the hope that lives within us. We love you for being such a good, good father in every day and everything that you do for us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are dismissed.